So as we get started with this tonight, it's probably pretty easily guessed why I have a class on just tomatoes and peppers. Uh, and, you know, let me just say, if there are brand names that I mentioned throughout this evening, it's just going to be for communication purposes. It's not to be an endorsement for myself or the university, nor are we in any way looking negatively at a brand I don't happen to mention. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, I don't think we talk much about pesticide usage in this talk, but if I were, nothing I say trumps the pesticide label. The label is the law. You must always read and follow those directions. So with those two caveats out of the way, tomatoes and peppers are definitely probably our two most favorite uh, garden vegetables that are grown. Certainly cucumbers are popular, um, squash and zucchini, not, you know, not too distant probably, but certainly tomatoes and peppers. If someone has one vegetable that they grow in a pot on their patio, you're almost assured it's either a tomato or a pepper. Uh, and so that's why we've got the focus this evening. Um, and, and the other thing about them is just how versatile they are in the kitchen. So if you like to cook or enjoy cooking, if you think about all the different, um, you know, culinary types around the world or, or countries, a number of them, tomatoes and peppers both feature heavily in their food. So whether we're talking about Asian cooking or Italian cooking, you know, tomatoes and peppers are both, you know, sort of the backbones of those. Without those, what do you have? Uh, so certainly they get a lot of use. And so it's not that we're stuck with just, you know, more zucchini bread or something like that. We can do a lot with these. And so they are versatile. And so that makes them something that we don't maybe get tired of them in the way we might with some vegetables that we're not as flexible with. The other thing, the reason we like talking about them together is they're related to each other. They're both part of the nightshade family or Solanaceae. Uh, and so they have a lot of the same problems. So pests that are pests for one are likely pests of the other. That's both insects and diseases. Growing conditions are fairly similar. There's a few differences, nothing dramatic. If you can grow one, you should be able to grow the other. Uh, and so that's good as well. And to point to their popularity, we actually have a number of different publications that UT has put together that is uh, rather focused on uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, and maybe even a little more so on tomatoes than peppers. Uh, but these are accessible through uthort.com. Uh, you can find all these there. They're going to be in the resources I send you. I don't know that every single one will be, but certainly you can get to them through uthort.com. So keep that one in mind. It's hard to list every resource that's available on some topics because basically it'd be a multi-page document and then that gets a little unwieldy uh, whenever we think about having it uh, for folks to utilize. So just some quick thoughts on just general vegetable garden. How are we successful with it? We like a full sun location, which is saying a minimum of six to eight hours. It doesn't mean that you can't get away if you're a little less than that, but certainly, ideally, you would have that much, if not more. Most of these um, vegetables that we grow in our gardens certainly like warm conditions. So, uh, you know, full sun is, is going to benefit them. So the more sun, the better. Uh, full sun is not a problem for these. We like well draining soils because our roots need oxygen as well as water. And so if it's a wet place, I advise you not to be planting there, not just these vegetables, but any. Our soil pH for a general garden six to seven and certainly tomatoes and peppers fall in that range. So that means we don't use lime unless we have a soil test that tells us. Um, if we have wood ashes, we use those very limitedly. Uh, that can be a problem sometimes where people will have wood ash available and they'll use quite a bit of it in a small area and they drive their pH much too alkaline or much too high. Uh, we need good fertility and that's going to vary a little bit on what we're growing, but certainly if we do a pre-plant fertilizer regime without a soil test, if we did a quarter of a pound of actual nitrogen per hundred square feet of growing area, that would put us in good shape for most things both peppers and tomatoes, as well as a number of other vegetables actually benefit from side dressing or mid-season application of nitrogen. And so I'll mention that later this evening. Uh, so keep that in mind too. We like to get them started off well, but because we can lose some fertilizer, particularly nitrogen to movement, whether it's in water or volatilization where it turns into nitrogen gas because of microbes, we don't put it all down at the first. The other thing is, 
with especially with tomatoes and peppers, we don't want a huge amount of nitrogen there because they'll just keep growing vegetatively and not want to go to reproductive if we throw a ton of nitrogen. So if you've ever had the six foot tall uh, pepper plant that was beautiful, dark green, but no flowers, you probably over fertilized it with nitrogen and that can happen. So I mentioned it a moment ago, this is actually the chart from uh, one of our publications, the Getting the Most Out of Your Home Vegetable Garden Soil Test Report. Uh, certainly soil tests are a good tool, and, but this chart is just speaking to in-season nitrogen fertilization or what a lot of people are familiar with as side dressing. And so you can see there, and this is not the entire chart either, there's other <clears throat> crops as well, but tomatoes and peppers, basically when our first fruits are getting to about an inch in diameter, we do like to add some additional nitrogen. And certainly peppers, if we have a, a later, uh, longer continuing season, we can actually hit them again with another application of nitrogen. They have some rates there for particular fertilizers. Uh, and so that may get uh, may be helpful for you to figure out how much to use. And certainly I'm always available to help you determine that as well. So talking about tomatoes, it's not yet time to plant tomatoes. Let's say that first. Uh, generally, we think in our area about the earliest we should go out is May 1st. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't have a frost event after that. It's just most likely we won't. We certainly have had in recent memory some frosts that were later than that. But uh, it's not just about frost events because actually we can have damage on tomatoes uh, even if they're not frosted, if it gets cold enough. So even if we don't have a full frost or a freeze happening, we can still see damage on these plants. So they are not able, they are a tender plant or they are a warm season plant. They do not do well. So if you've looked recently at like the two week forecast, after tomorrow, we won't be back in the 70s. Uh, through those two weeks. And so I would say I would not push the envelope and put tomatoes out right now, and certainly not peppers. And part of the reason is that second bullet point. It's not only the air temperature, it's also the soil temperature. And certainly we've been enjoying some nice sunny days that helps bring our soil temperature up, but we wanna make sure that those soils are warm enough because these are warm season plants. And if we stick them in cold soil, they're just gonna sit there anyway. So we're not really gaining anything by putting them out real early. And so I always encourage people, when you get close to May 1st, start looking at the long range forecast. And if they're not predicting, you know, a frost event, you're probably good around May 1st. This year, I may say, you know, hold over a few more days and just let the soil warm some more just because we're getting more appropriately seasonal temperatures. I don't think we're going to be breaking any records for low temperatures, uh, but, you know, it just allows the soil more time to warm up. But certainly be cautious. If you're in a raised bed, if you're in a container, you have a little more flexibility with this. Raised beds typically do warm up faster than the ground. That's one of the benefits, but that's also why they use more water uh, through the growing season. Uh, so certainly your uh, growing location and specifics of how you do it will cause some variance with that. But certainly don't get ahead of yourself with planting these out too early. Uh, the other thing about temperature is high temperatures can be damaging to tomatoes. Uh, so certainly when we're having daytime temperatures above 85 degrees, we're probably not going to have pollination be successful. It's just too hot. So if you've ever grown tomatoes and literally you can see as things begin to ripen, you see those fruit on there and then there's kind of a gap and then there's more fruit. What could have happened, and it's not an absolute, but what could have happened in the growth area that you're seeing there is there were high temperatures that prevented pollination from being successful. That is something that we do see happen. So it is something to be aware of. Uh, the other thing is it's not just daytime temperatures, even nighttime temperatures. When we have very hot temperatures that continue into the night and they don't drop, that can cause some problems with flower abortion. The, it, this is variety dependent, and there are some varieties that are marketed to uh, certainly areas that would be uh, warmer than we are, and, and so you can find some that may be more resistant to this, so it may be worthwhile from time to time to trial some of those in your own garden, see if they otherwise do well. If they do, they may be good to include in the rotation of tomatoes you grow. One thing on tomatoes I always like to mention is the difference in the two main types, and that would be indeterminate versus determinate. So what indeterminate means is it just continues to grow until they die. So you have larger plants. 
They offer a bigger harvest because they keep growing over a longer period of time. So it's more spaced out. So in theory, you can plant these in May and they'll keep growing until they're killed by frost. Realistically, lots of times in our garden, they start having problems with disease as they start getting older. And so lots of times they don't last that long. But in theory, they're going to continue to grow until they die, whether it's a frost or from disease, insect pressure, et cetera. And so these will give you the largest harvest, but it's over a longer period of time. So if you've ever grown tomatoes, they've just completely overgrown the cages or, or however you had them trellised and, you know, it turns into a uh, tomato thicket rather than a nice tomato bed with individual plants, you're probably growing indeterminates. And there's a lot of plants, uh, that, uh, tomatoes that we grow commonly that are indeterminate. Nothing wrong with it, just understand they're gonna be large plants. These are not the ones that you wanna have on your patio. And these are not the ones that you want the little small wire cages around because it's not gonna hold the plant up, it's insufficient. Determinate on the other hand, basically when they reach a determined height or they stop growing. So this is better for smaller uh, scale production like in containers as well as, you know, in areas where you don't want them to overgrow an area. They're smaller plants so that you do get less harvest, but it's also more concentrated over a period of time. So that means you will have these tomatoes, all of them coming ripe on the plant in a shorter window, typically, you know, 10 days, two weeks. Some people that particularly like to can like growing uh, determinate tomatoes because it can narrow some of the job window. So you have, you know, maybe you do a couple pickings this week and can and do a couple pickings next week. You're not doing it, you know, every two or three weeks for a longer period. And so there's not a right or wrong answer to say, which do I grow other than determinate are certainly much better when you have limited space. Uh, but, it, you know, yes, they yield less, but they're also smaller plants. So you can actually probably pack them in a little bit tighter in a given area as well. So just understand the two differences. I would say, you know, grow a mix unless you're trying to grow in containers. And then I'm probably going to point you towards determinate ones. Sometimes these are referred to as bush tomatoes. Uh, and certainly we do have, you know, miniature tomatoes or dwarf tomatoes, depending where you're looking, what catalog you may see them in, that are really well suited to small containers. They do say smaller. Uh, and certainly it's easier to be successful with those in a container than it is something like an indeterminate. One thing that's beneficial to our indeterminate tomatoes is suckering. Right? And suckering is just removing the suckers. And suckers are just adventitious shoots that are growing. And so you see them depicted there in the axial where the leaf is joining the stem. Those suckers are basically a new stem that starts growing. Now they're not a bad thing, but the reason we remove them early in the season is we want to concentrate growth on an earlier, faster harvest. We'll have them pop up from the root or from low on the stem. We can remove those as well, because again, and basically it is just redirecting some energy to vegetative growth. At the same time, we're trying to get those first flowers uh, to pollinate as well as turn into fruit. So basically allows more energy to go to those very first fruit or tomatoes. And so that's why we do it. It also keeps the plant a little bit more open if we don't sucker, we have more growth in that plant. It's going to be a little more crowded. And as a result, uh, we do have less airflow. We like airflow in our um, vegetable plants, just like we do in our fruit trees, because the less wetness we have on leaves and stems, the less likely we are to have disease. So we sucker one to push uh, energy flow into those earlier fruit and two to limit some of the gangliness of that plant early on and keep it maybe more open to air. So certainly after that first one below your first flower, remove them. Now what's interesting is you can actually root those suckers. So tomatoes actually root very easily and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if you want to have a second planting, you can actually take these suckers and place them just in moist potting soil. Don't put them out in direct sun immediately because they don't have roots yet. And so they're not able to replenish water that they lose from the leaves. But as they begin to root and it won't take them very long, you can actually have new transplants to plant out. And because it's coming as a vegetative plant, they'll actually get to flowering quicker than if you were to sow seed at the same time. 
And so because of their maturity, they do reach reproductive age faster. And so that is a way to actually uh, get a second planting out of plants you may have already bought. Determinant, typically we do not prune. Again, they're already kind of in a essence sort of self pruning. If you prune a determinant plant, you're probably going to reduce the yield because you're removing uh, some of the structure on a plant that's already limited. With pruning suckers on indeterminate, they're never really going to notice that you did that because, again, you're doing it when these are small. You don't want them to be ginormous. Uh, when you prune these out, most of the time just going in there with your thumb and finger and breaking them out is the best way. You don't typically need to cut them out um, because, again, we're trying to do it when they are small and just have a few leaves to them. Uh, but doing that uh, does benefit, again, that early fruit production and harvest. You just do it the once. So that's a good question. You don't have to do that consistently throughout the season. Certainly, if you are trying to control the size on some indeterminates, trying to keep them from overgrowing a space and you're doing pruning that way. I've known some commercial producers that are growing like heirloom plants that at some point in the season, they decide the plants are large enough and they'll just go in with hedge clippers and basically top all the plants. And it's because they have to be able to get in there to harvest. They have to be able to get in there to spray things like fungicides. And so if they let them get too large, it can't happen. And so you can do that and still get harvest off of what's already there. Uh, whenever you're topping plants like that, you're obviously cutting potential future harvest out, uh, but you're not gonna harm the fruit that's already there forming and growing. Uh, but yeah, but generally the suckering of plants only happens initially that first time. And after that, you just allow them to grow. Peppers, again, very similar to tomatoes, but maybe even more so uh, sensitive to frost and even low temperatures. So we would normally say, you know, plant them after you have your tomatoes planted. Uh, and so we're not saying May 1st with that, with a look to the forecast, but rather probably the next week, you know, May 8th. Again, not just air temperatures, also soil temperatures. You'll notice this is a little bit higher than tomatoes, just to reflect that sensitivity. And certainly, again, we can see flower abortion or failure to pollinate when we have high daytime temperatures. One thing that can happen with peppers is very low nighttime temperatures. So if we have unseasonably cool weather and they're flowering, we can actually lose flowers that way. And certainly, again, there is some difference in varieties to sensitivity to this. Uh, so if it's something that you're worried about, you may be able to find some that do have greater tolerance to higher temperatures. When we're talking about these, typically we're talking about transplants that we're putting in our garden. We don't have to. We can absolutely direct sow tomatoes and peppers if we wanted to. Typically we don't because when we put a large, when we put a plant out there, it's older, it's already been growing, we get to harvest faster. That's why we do transplant production. But if we wanted to do our own transplants, tomatoes, we want about six weeks before we plant them out, maybe add in three or four days to allow for germination. Peppers, we'd say eight weeks, they are slower growing. So if you've ever planted peppers and tomatoes at the same time for transplant production, you're gonna notice typically peppers are slower to come up and they just don't grow as fast. Tomatoes are much quicker growing. So that's why we have a two week difference there that is reflective in the vigor of the plant or how quickly they grow. Depending uh, what varieties we're looking at for both tomatoes as well as peppers, we can have, you know, harvest 55 to 60 days from transplanting. So although these certainly can produce over a longer window, we can get them pretty quickly to be harvesting for us. One way we can extend that harvest is by planting successive planting. So plant transplants this week wait two to three weeks, plant them again, wait two to three weeks. And so rather than planting 45 tomatoes at once, we may plant three times 15 each time. And what that does, that allows for a peak of harvest to be at different points rather than everything happening at once. So especially if you're eating fresh out of the garden and you're not really concerned about preserving things, we strongly encourage you to look at planting successively because it just means longer harvest period for you. Um, the other thing you can do is look at planting different varieties. So if you have a, you know, one of the early tomatoes that's 55 or 60 days, and you have another one that's much later, maybe an 80 day tomato, if you plant them both at the same time, the first one will come to harvest faster than the other one. So just by planting different varieties, we can also have a longer period of harvest. Uh, 
And, and so just think of that as well. One thing that I think about peppers is we're actually dealing with different plants, botanically speaking. We kind of lump them all together and certainly they're all in the same genus, but we actually have four main species of peppers that are kind of the umbrellas for all the different varieties in there. And so these all do originate in the uh, Americas. I, I know the habanero there, especially with the species name, um, which I think if, it's, if I remember correctly, it's pronounced Chinense. Uh, it almost makes us think of China perhaps. It may be in reference to that somehow, but it certainly is not its origin. All of these did come from the Americas, which again, I think is interesting at how they've spread across the world for culinary purposes uh, when uh, they were only sort of discovered, so to speak, uh, by other parts of the world in you know, late 1400s at the earliest. Uh, so certainly I just think this is interesting. Some of these are not as familiar to us. So like the Bacottums, uh, those are, they're, you're able to grow those here, but they are a little bit difficult. Um, they have a very long growing season. They're more for tropical areas. But if you've ever seen, especially like Uba Tubas, they're interesting shape. The Bishop's Crown are very similar, uh, but uh, not exactly the same thing as the bell peppers or jalapenos that we're used to, but certainly a lot of different shapes, colors, sizes, heat levels, some very sweet, some very hot, uh, a lot of interesting things in the pepper world. So when we plant these in the garden, basically if we've got to transplant that pepper, we plant it at the same depth it was growing as a transplant. Not difficult. Ordinarily, I mean, this is how we would plant 99% of every plant that we grow in the garden, whether vegetable or ornamental, we don't bury stems. It doesn't work out well. This is a big problem in the landscape world with trees and woody materials uh, being planted too deep and then that leading to problems down the road. So this is one that we wanna make sure we do a good job with even with an annual, but straightforward. Tomatoes are one, however, we can actually plant deeper than it was growing. So it goes back to when we're talking about those suckers rooting readily. Well, the stems on tomatoes will root very readily when they come in contact with the ground or soil. So we can actually take a transplant and plant it deeper than it's growing. We can bury the stems. So lots of times you'll see this recommendation if you have a tall gangly plant, you can actually plant it uh, deeper or lay it on its side and plant the stem horizontally. Um, you can do that, uh, but realistically, I think it's better to have a small, vigorously growing transplant. So one of the challenges that happens is people will start, you know, if we're saying May 1st for our tomatoes to be in the garden, that means we would plant them, sow them for transplants around the middle of March. There will be people that sow those in February uh, or earlier. And the problem is then you get this typically a really tall plant that's very, very root bound. And lots of times they're not getting enough light. So they, they even stretch out the internodes. It's not just an older plant. It's really long between sets of leaves. Those are not the best transplants. They're not as rapidly growing as a young one. Uh, and we're, we do know that when we stress plants in the transplant stage, it does carry through to production. So there is research that says if we're stressing plants as transplants, it does reduce production. Doesn't mean we can't be successful, but ideally we have a young, vigorously growing transplant. I would rather you be a week or two late getting started than be a week or two early because a small plant put out into the garden when it's nice and warm is going to grow great. A big gangly plant isn't going to be as well. Uh, I have seen where people will talk about, well, you know, they, they plant their tomatoes with a post hole. I've literally seen it, you know, online. And they will dig like a three-foot hole and put a ginormous plant in it. And then typically they will amend that hole tremendously. So it won't be the native soil that's there. It will be just compost or things like that. What we know about whenever we modify a planting hole dramatically Whenever it's a dramatically different soil or material than what's around it, we change how water flows in and out of it. And that's really bad. We can create water soaked situations. We can create situations where it's very dry. So I don't like to amend planting holes where they're completely different than what's around them anyway. Certainly we know roots need oxygen. If we've got a 24 or 30 inch hole, how much oxygen is at the bottom of that hole? I don't know. 
Uh, and so I really think that growing a tomato plant purposely large so we can bury it is not the best plan. I think a small transplant that's rapidly growing is going to get you a better yield in the end. And I think you will see it perform very well and grow very rapidly in the garden under the right conditions. So here is what this can kind of look like when we're talking about rooting along the stem. This can happen in high humidity situations. Some varieties are more prone to it than the other. So lots of times we'll see these little bumps on the stem. That's not anything to be concerned with. Those would be called root initials. It's the initial start of adventitious roots. Uh, and so if we have a tomato that's not trellised or caged up well and the stems are in contact with the ground, you will see that it roots down. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, and so certainly, you know, if you see those or like on the right where you see a cluster of them, that looks kind of weird and you think, uh oh, what's wrong with my plant? That's actually not anything to be concerned with. Those are just aerial roots. Uh, aerial roots happen on some things. We have some uh, apple tree root stalks that are prone to causing aerial roots on apple trees. So we can see some things sometimes on apple trees that look really funky. So it's not only tomatoes that can do this, uh, but it's not anything to be concerned with. And again, this is why we can root those suckers and actually have a new plant because they will root quite readily. I do encourage both peppers and tomatoes to be caged or staked or trellised in some way. It needs to be something that can handle a lot of weight, particularly whenever we're talking about indeterminate tomatoes. We can get a lot of growth on those. So the little wire cages all the way on the right are perfect for a dwarf tomato that's grown in a pot on your patio. It's going to be lousy out in the garden for a lot of your other ones because they, it just simply will not withstand the weight. Certainly, if you add a stake to it, that would help. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's no one right or wrong way to do staking or caging. Uh, on the left there, you see uh, a Florida weave, which is basically utilizing um, string to uh, act as a cage, more or less, for those peppers or tomatoes there. It's, uh, it's kind of the standard for industry production. Certainly, stakes, tying uh, individual plants to stakes is okay. Having well anchored uh, stakes and fencing running in between them and tying them to fencing. But there's, again, the, the ingenuity on how you accomplish this is unlimited, but by keeping these upright, it does help with harvest. It can definitely reduce some diseases that we see that can be prevalent in our plants. So there is benefit to this. It's not just about making your garden look nicer than someone else's. There's actually some benefit to it. I do like to use mulch whenever we're talking about our vegetable gardens and particularly with uh, tomatoes and peppers both. Uh, one of the things it does, it reduces the water loss from soil in part because it keeps soil cooler. And so by doing that, that means we're able to extend the water that we have there. So it helps even out moisture level in the soil. And that's gonna be important for blossom end rot that we'll mention in a moment. So organic mulches, which basically are stuff that just used to be living at some point, uh, we like those because they add fertility to the soil as they break down. And these can be anything from your uh, lawn clippings that you might be collecting. It could be last year's leaves. It can be animal bedding. There's, again, if it was a living material, it can work. Wood chips can work well. We don't wanna till those into the soil because that can really limit nitrogen availability. But as a surface, surface mulch, we typically do not have a problem um, with uh, having it at the surface level alone. It doesn't create a big issue in the garden. We do wanna have some caution. Uh, past few years, we've run into this a couple of times when people's added manure to their uh, gardens or hay or animal bedding. There can be persistent herbicides. And by persistent herbicides, I mean herbicides that are expressing their activity or able to kill plants once they're in your garden. So there are herbicides and see those listed there that even passing through an animal's digestive the system will not render them inert. Even composting them, if anything, it might make them last longer, believe it or not. So even if you have older manure piles or things like that, these can still be actively uh, killing plants. So we typically see symptoms first on things like beans and tomatoes. 
uh, peas as well will show symptoms. And so we do have to know the history if we're utilizing things like manures or forages or even our lawns, what herbicide chemicals have been used. So if you can't get answers to those questions, you can do what uh, a bioassay where essentially you uh, try to grow some of these very sensitive plants in a mixture largely of the compost or, or material and see if there is any negative growth effects. Uh, but if you can't get an answer and you don't wanna do that bioassay test, I'd say don't use it because if you use these, they can cause problems for several years in your garden. So it's not something that's easily remedied. Uh, and so sometimes maybe avoidance is our best policy. Integrated pest management. So we won't go in depth with integrated pest management or IPM. If I wanted to simplify it to one slide, I'd basically say you don't first reach for a chemical control. So as a gardener, you look at other strategies first. This is everything from, you know, physical strategies like using a floating row cover to keep insects off the plants. It could be adjusting the timing of your planting to avoid the peak uh, pest population. Uh, it could be making sure that we're doing a good job removing all the plants as they're done producing so we don't let them be a nursery for disease or insects in the garden either this year or next crop rotation. So we're moving plant families around so that we don't plant uh, susceptible families back in the same spot year after year. And of course, you know, basically making sure we have a healthy plant because healthy plants are able to better resist pests, whether insects or diseases. I think I said that that first bullet point there, but healthy plants is kind of the number one strategy to start with. Uh, there are some good things uh, such as um, resistant varieties. And so the next slide, I believe, well, this is all several of our publications related to pest in the garden. So controlling garden insects, uh, some specific uh, publications about diseases of tomatoes, and then just general home garden control. The upper right is an interesting publication and kind of, kind of gives you more information. So lots of times, um, we have the publications that tell you, you know, what are some common pests, what are the best products to control them, and that's kind of it. The upper right one actually has a little more to it where it kind of gives you more information about the different sorts of products and how they can best be used. So if you're interested in, you know, especially looking at different organic or conventional products, kind of contrasting those, that's the publication to look at. It does a good job of that. It gives you some good information that will maybe help you when you look to select uh, some chemical control strategies. And certainly very often in our gardens, we do need to use some chemical controls for either disease or insects. A big thing I encourage folks to do is plant resistant varieties. And so first off, it is resistance, which is not immunity. So it doesn't mean if we plant uh, something that does have some resistance to some of these diseases that we can't have an issue, but it just means in a given situation, we're less likely to see uh, high levels of damage or if it were a susceptible variety, we would see more damage in those varieties. So we like to see as much resistance in tomatoes as possible. So there on that seed packet where you see aroma VF, the VF is referring to two uh, different uh, diseases, verticillium as well as fusarium. Uh, and so this aroma is actually resistant to those. So particularly if we know our gardens have had that in the past. And what happens too is, you know, if we had it when we had the tomatoes over there, chances are we might have it in the other end of the garden too. Because lots of times we're using the same uh, tools and implements in the garden. So we can spread it around in the garden. Water flow in the garden can spread some of these diseases around. So while we rotate and that's good, it doesn't mean if we're in one in the garden, we can't have it again. And so I, I encourage you, if you know you've had some problems in the past, looking at rotating as long as you can, but also specifically seeking out resistant varieties. Challenge is we don't have resistance for every pest that's out there. So just because you've had a disease or problems with an insect, that doesn't mean you can find an answer through resistance. But certainly uh, we do have a lot of options. Generally, we see higher levels of resistance with more 
um, modern varieties and hybrids because that's one of the things they specifically breed for. So typically it's not to say that heirlooms shouldn't be grown in your garden, but certainly typically some of our most resistant and toughest plants are gonna be more modern varieties. When we start looking at some specific pests that we can find with insects, uh, we do certainly find that there's a lot of common insects between tomatoes and peppers. And certainly there are some insects that we find in the garden that are very much generalist. So they don't care who they're eating on, they'll eat on everybody. Uh, and so they certainly share those with other plants. Aphids are one that would be a generalist. And so we can find these on about anything in our garden. Uh, there's many different species of aphids. You can see them in different colors depicted there. They're very small and they start out with a very small infestation typically. So if you look closely at your plants, and this is where I always tell older folks that, you know, if you use reading glasses, they need to be with you in the garden because you need to be looking under leaves, along stems, and you need to find these little bitty tiny things. And if you use reading glasses and they're not with you, you're probably not gonna see these until there's such a problem that they're gonna be really hard to deal with. So we've got some school gardens we do. And like one fall, we had some aphids that were on, you know, some very young broccoli transplants. I found them after we'd planted them. They've been there a couple of weeks in the garden, just smushed them with my fingers. And that was enough because I saw them early. The population was really low and it took care of it. If I hadn't seen it for two weeks, that probably wouldn't have worked. I may have been having to pull some plants out. And in fact, I think I pulled off a couple of leaves on some of the broccoli because they were just really heavily infested, had a lot of aphids on them. And so it's much better just to get them out of the garden. Uh, so certainly if you have a plant sometimes that is very infested, it may make sense to remove it. Uh, you'll see here, you know, when you do have a small beginning infestation, sometimes just blasting them off the plant with a water hose can work. Because again, they're little plants, so, uh, excuse me, little insects, and when you blast them off that plant, that can be enough to interrupt kind of the cycle and, and do well. There are a lot of beneficials. So we think of things like ladybugs, uh, we'll eat these, but a lot of different uh, insects will eat these at one stage or another. Some of them eat them as adults, some as larvae. So, you know, in a well-balanced garden, let's say, hopefully there's some beneficial predators out there that keep the levels moderate to where it's not a huge deal. But certainly there are chemical control options available to us. Tomato fruit worm or corn earworm, we call it one or the other, depending what it's eating on. And so this is one that is a caterpillar. It is coming uh, from a moth. And so it does uh, get well controlled with BT sprays or Bacillus thuringiensis. And so that would be an organic option for those looking for organic options. And BT sprays work very well as long as we have them in place in time because they work well on small caterpillars. They're not as effective on large ones. Uh, and so it is something that you may have to reapply multiple times throughout the season. So every seven to 10 days on most products, I think you will see is the recommended uh, spray reapplication window and you need good coverage. Um, for instance, you need to make sure you're getting on the underside of leaves. Like, so we, we have different caterpillars that will get on our brassica crops. So if you're out there spraying broccoli or cabbage, you wanna make sure you're not just spraying the top of the leaves where you'll probably never see uh, caterpillar munching, but also on the underside where they really are, because BT is a product that they actually have to eat, and then the bacteria basically creates a protein in their stomach that kills the caterpillar. This is something that even uh, conventional growers will use, even though it may be originally an organic product, because it's highly effective. So this is one that if you want to look at limiting caterpillar damage, BT sprays, as long as you have it in place when they're young and small, is a very good option. Flea beetles, another generalist we see uh, out there that really like solanaceous plants. They can cause a lot of damage. I've seen solanaceous weeds, so related to tomatoes and peppers, just get absolutely hammered in a field before by flea beetles. Uh, and so they do like solanaceous crops. Generally, you see little small holes and a lot of them on leaves. Uh, you may see the little black beetles there. Sometimes they'll have some stripes on them. They're very tiny. They like to jump away. So that's how they kind of got the common name of flea beetle. They're dark and like to jump, kind of like fleas. Floating row cover are one option for these. 
Um, we can see, especially as uh, you have rapidly growing transplants, that sometimes they'll just outgrow the damage. So this is not one that if you have a very low level, it's probably a huge concern. But when you start seeing significant levels of damage, you definitely want to look at uh, a control option. So this would be one to be on the lookout for when you start seeing a few little holes in the leaves, start paying attention. It looks like their numbers are increasing. It's probably worthwhile to do a chemical treatment option, but certainly things like floating row covers can be very effective. Just keep in mind, we are gonna to have to pull those floating row covers off of things like peppers, tomatoes, uh, because they need to pollinate. And so that's not gonna happen underneath those covers. But generally, if we get transplants up growing quickly, these kind of fade into the background. I think of flea beetles as a bigger problem earlier in the season when my plants are small. If they're growing well otherwise, I've seen them outgrow flea beetle damage. So Colorado potato beetle. So this is one that likes all the solanaceous crops uh, and it's kind of the poster child for insecticide resistance. So what insecticide resistance is, is you have a uh, product that used to kill a um, pest and now it does not. And so resistance happens over time with any product. Uh, you know, we think of things like uh, resistance to antibiotics with human health, kind of the same principles. And so we actually find a lot of populations of Colorado potato beetle that some of them are more common go-to uh, insecticides for insects just don't do it because they are resistant. So this is one that finding them early and looking at some of the newer chemistries uh, will actually be beneficial. You can see there the adult, the eggs, and then the larva as well. So, you know, early on, you're not going to see a lot of them. And this is where when you're out there inspecting fields or, or scouting, as the word is in integrated pest management, you're going to be flipping over leaves, you're going to be looking in leaf whorls, you're going to be closely inspecting plants because you want to find them when there's very few adults and there's very few eggs. Because, you know, if you can remove that egg cluster there, you've just removed a number of beetles and they're not going to have all their offspring. So early control on a lot of these is important. And again, if you're growing solanaceous things, consider some of the newer chemistries maybe before you reach for some of the older active ingredients like carbaryl or malathion, particularly with this pest. Stink bugs are one that cause damage. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't. Uh, eat the fruit, but it does cause those unsightly areas. So on tomatoes, we see those yellow spots that pop up. Uh, we'll also see as depicted there with the pepper, you actually see a white damage in the fruit itself. It's where they basically uh, have been feeding. And so you'll, you can see those either rarely on fruit or fruit that have a large number of them when you have large uh, stink bug populations. We have more than one stink bug out there. One that a lot of us are familiar with is the brown marmorated stink bug. That's the one that we see in our house. That's our overwintering friend. And so that one is actually a newer pest. It's not been around that long for us, uh, but uh, it is one that can cause high levels of damage when you've got high populations. Certainly there are good chemical controls for these. Lots of times for home gardeners, uh, you know, that damage may or may not be the end of the world for you. If you have a low population and just a little damage here or there on fruits, it's not a big deal. But if you have large populations, it can cause quite a bit of damage. So we should be killing them? Oh, yes, the brown marmorated stink bugs we should be killing. You can also see depicted there a green stink bug and there's some others too. Now we do have to have a little caution because not everything that's shaped like a stink bug is a bad guy. We actually have a predator stink bug uh, that you can see depicted here that you may find, but you can see it's very different uh, looking than we have uh, from that green one or the brown marmorated. Uh, you can see they have stripes on their legs that are very distinctive, and you see there's actually two color forms as well. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's worth pausing and making sure is the insect I'm seeing beneficial or is it a pest? 
Uh, and certainly the ones that are in our house, those are going to be pests. That's the brown marmorated stink bug. And so they, they're invasive in Virginia. They are. I had Cornell University and Virginia Tech doing research on my house yep. and all the stink bugs. Yeah. But they destroy peach. Yeah, and that's it. They, uh, the stink, again, these are a generalist uh, or, or the bad ones. Let's go back. These guys are generalists. They feed on a lot of different crops, fruits, uh, everything else. So, I mean, these are not good ones to have around. I've been picking them up and rescuing them and putting them outside. In the garden. Well, I was going to say, now you know. So, yeah. So, do not feel guilty if you're killing those when they're in your house. Uh, they are stink bugs. So, if you grab them, yeah, you know, just understand that they will release a foul smelling liquid. But uh, certainly, that's one that you shouldn't have any uh, negative thoughts about killing them when you find them in your house. So, tomato hornworms, uh, it is the caterpillar again. Uh, this time of the moth you see depicted there. This is also a tobacco hornworm, uh, so they can be on either crop. Again, it's a caterpillar. BT works well on young uh, caterpillars. One of the things we see first sometimes in the garden that says what makes us say what's going on here is actually depicted in the top picture. That is actually the caterpillar frass or its poo. And so that is what caterpillar dung looks like. And because these are large caterpillars, even when they're small, they they're still produce a noticeable uh, fecal matter. And so you'll see these little pellets on the ground and think, what in the world? So very often, that's what you first see. It's not even damage on the plant necessarily, because if you have a robust plant that's a growing well, you're not going to notice a little bit of early damage. But you can actually sometimes see that on bare ground, or if you have mulch, you see the little black things on mulch. And that will actually clue you in, wait a second, something's going on. The other neat thing about these, if you have a black light or ultraviolet light, like a flashlight, and you go out at night, these will actually for less under UV light. So you can actually find these at night to find them glowing. So I, I have known a small organic grower that he basically would patrol his uh, peppers, you know, a few nights a week with a, a UV flashlight looking for these. So certainly, you know, we do have BT as an organic option, as well as conventional chemistries are good. But on a small scale, if you want to go out there at night and look for some uh, fluorescing caterpillars, that's an option as well. Mm -hmm. you just pinch them. Yep, exactly. Or take them fishing or, or whatever you would like. Uh, hopefully you find them before they're very large because, I mean, they can be really large and they're, they're a neat caterpillar. They're not going to sting you or anything like that. So that, that's a good thing about it. Uh, but, yep, they, you know, it, it's one of those things where, I don't feel too badly about killing something like this, even though it's the larva of a moth, just because, you know, we do have solanaceous weeds out there. So I don't think their numbers are under, you know, threat or concern. So again, these can, you know, they are big caterpillars and we have several of them on a plant. They can eat one bear. So, I mean, they, they can be very damaging. So they're neat looking, they're fun, but they also are a truly destructive pest. However, if you're out there at night with your UV flashlight, don't pick this one off and squish it. So what this is, is actually a caterpillar that has been parasitized by wasp. So those are actually cocoons. So the wasp will actually lay an egg inside the caterpillar or multiple eggs in this case. And then they, those larvae will feed on the caterpillars and then they pupate as you see there. And then an adult will emerge from the white cocoons. And so when you see this, these caterpillars, they aren't doing well. They've had larvae eating them on the inside. They don't eat a lot themselves. And this is a nursery for a predator insect that's going to control more caterpillars. So that guy right there, when they look like that, and it's not just this caterpillar, you will see any number of species of caterpillars that are attacked by any number of the braconid wasp or others, let them be because these are your nursery for a predator insect that eats pests. So these are good guys. When you see this, let them stay. Wasps grow. These little wasps, some of them are little bitty tiny wasps. These are not people stinging wasps. These are caterpillar stinging wasps. So that's a good, that's a good thing to point out. So these wasps are not the paper wasp or, or that cause problems for us. These are a parasitic wasp and they only sting caterpillars to lay eggs. They're not the ones that go out there and that's probably a different species. So, I mean, that's it. Parasitoid wasp is a big umbrella group. 
there's a lot of wasps that attack insects in one way or another. Yep. And so that's, so, you know, that's one of the strategies they use is they try to figure out, you know, if we have an invasive pest that is introduced to the U.S., are there in their native ranges a predator such as this that might be beneficial? You have to be careful because sometimes predators can have a wider palate than just the insect you want them to attack. So there, there, there's always that concern. And that's why we don't always, you know, have a, a predatory, uh, you know, wasp or something for an invasive insect. It's because, well, if we release that in the environment, it could attack all these other species that we don't want to attack. And so uh, it's not an easy answer, but certainly there are numerous parasitoid wasps out there for any number of different caterpillar or, or other insect species. There are even, um, uh, there's actually, a, it may not be a parasit, it's not a parasitoid wasp, but there's actually kind of like a predatory fly that will attack um, fire ants even. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that there's a lot of uh, natural control options out there that could be exploited in some scenarios. But when you see these cocoons on these caterpillars, let them be, that's a nursery for good guys. Certainly this is another good guy that we wanna keep around. Uh, you know, we have the multicolored lady Asian beetle or ladybugs as most of us think of them. You know, they're not a native species, but they do eat the bad guys. So, you know, I, I don't think we're gonna eradicate those. So it's probably not worth the effort. They do come in a wide range of color forms as you see depicted in that picture. Those are still all Asian lady beetles. Um, you know, it's certainly different than, uh, you know, sometimes I have seen people mistake a Mexican bean beetle for a Asian ladybug. And it's because they're similar in shape and they have, to me, the bean beetle is a much more copper color than I've ever seen an Asian lady beetle. So if, you, if you're finding a lot of Asian lady beetles on your beans, make sure you're not looking at Mexican bean beetles, especially if they're very copper looking and they don't have the same uh, W or uh, M shape on their face or head like that, that you see there depicted with the black and white. So that will be absent on the Mexican bean beetle. So that's a good way to tell. Yeah, yeah, the copper ones are the bad guys. These are all good guys. Now, one lady beetle that you may not be real familiar with, and I've actually seen these in some um, community gardens here in Washington County, is the spotted lady beetle. It's actually pink, and it's not as nearly as circular. It's much more linear. You see it there in the top right-hand corner. And it's got black spots, but again, that's a good predator that is eating other insects that are harming our plants. And of course, we have the classic red and black uh, lady beetle, uh, the seven spotted there. There's a twice stab lady beetle that's black with two red spots. So just keep in mind that if you don't recognize what something is, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically a bad guy. The other thing to take into account goes back to what stage of life we're seeing these in. So certainly the adults are fairly familiar to us, but are you familiar with either the larva at hatching and like in the top left-hand corner there, very small, all dark, or you see the larva as they start to get a little bit older in the two bottom pictures going counterclockwise. Both of those you can find eating uh, aphids, for instance, and it kind of looks weird and different and certainly doesn't look like a ladybug, but that's actually a ladybug. Mm -hmm. And then the next two pictures stacked on the right hand side, those are actually the pupa. So that's the larva that is waiting to emerge as that adult beetle. And so we definitely want to be familiar with these and not mistake them because if we go in there and we're spraying an insecticide because we think these are bad, we're going to kill our good insects. And so that can actually cause resurgence where we'll have a pest population resurge because we killed off all our beneficial insects that are eating them. So we do want to be careful how we attack problems. So I thought I'd mention a few diseases quickly. We're not going to become experts on these, but just mention them. There are a number of diseases that can affect uh, both tomatoes and peppers. Uh, early blight is one we don't see with peppers, but this one we will see with potatoes and eggplant also solanaceous crops. So if you think about the Irish uh, potato famine, this was the disease that caused it. 
And so it can be very devastating. Typically it starts on the lower foliage. It is actually coming from the soil. So if we can prevent soil from splashing onto that lower foliage, either by removing it, by utilizing mulch, um, we are better off for it. There are resistant varieties, but if we're also planting non-resistant varieties, we don't want them having planted right next to each other because it's kind of like, you know, doing preparations to prevent from getting the disease and then go hang out with people that have it. <laughs> Even though we may have taken a vaccine or kept our health great, if we are exposing ourselves to a high level of a disease, we're more likely to see it happen no matter what we've done. And it's the same thing. So if you do have highly resistant, especially to like this disease and then those that are not, you don't necessarily want to plant them side by side. So just be aware of that. This one is a frequent visitor to home gardens. It is not a disease, at least not caused by an organism. So what we are looking at is blossom end rot. So it gets its name because it's the blossoming of the fruit. You can especially see in the top left picture where they're still attached to the stem. You can see that is exactly the dead opposite or the blossom end of that stem. So what it's characterized is by these colors. It may or may not have some of that growth that we see. Those are actually secondary invaders. They're just taking advantage of dead material to eat on. But we see a sunken area, oftentimes, if it's not wet conditions, it won't grow fungusy, but it will be kind of like leathery and depressed, like we see, especially on the right-hand side. So this is blossom end rot. So I just said it wasn't caused by a disease organism. We find it also on peppers. A little bit different presentation. Very often on peppers, it will cause kind of a curving or twisting of the bottom end. So it may not look like it's happening on the end of the pepper. It may look like it's happening on the side. But if you look closely, it's still on that blossom end. We can actually even see it in squash, like yellow squash can actually get it. So blossom end rot is not a disease. It's actually a calcium deficiency. So how do we deal with this? Well, it goes back to how does calcium get into the plant? Because our soils literally have hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of calcium in them. But that doesn't mean it's getting into the plant. And the way calcium gets into the plant is with the flow of water. It's not actively or selectively taken up. It's just as the plant is taking in water, there are calcium ions dissolved in the water and it goes into the plant. So what happens to cause this is we have uneven watering. So we let things get dry and then we water them and then they get dry and then we water them. And so what happens is basically that plant, when it gets water, it says, yay, we've got water. Let's grow real fast now. And it does. And it grows so fast that it can't deliver enough calcium to that fruit. Because basically what the calcium does is kind of glues the layers of cells together. And so when the calcium is not there, they collapse. And so that's why we get that sunken in look to the fruit. And so the fruit itself anyway is not where a lot of water leaves the plant because we think about water is being lost by plants through their leaves. So most of the water flow naturally goes to the leaves to keep them cool, keep them photosynthesizing. And so whenever we do get those dry periods and you know there's a lack of water, there's probably even less water that makes it to that fruit. So the way we deal with this is having even water supply to that plant as much as possible. So that's why I said I like mulch. Mulch helps to even out the water supply because you're reducing loss from the soil. Certainly mulch doesn't mean we don't have to water our plants, but it can help uh, make it less up and down on availability. So the number one thing to do is to look at how we're watering and basically water more frequently. Understand that as those plants are getting bigger, they are utilizing more water. So if we were doing a timer for watering, excuse me, previously with the irrigation system, just understand that might work well when they were two weeks old. When we're getting into the fruiting situation, we've now got a much bigger plant that needs a lot more water and typically higher temperatures. So just understand it's not that we're watering the same way from the beginning, middle, and end of the season. There are differences in the amount and frequency we would be applying. We like to irrigate or water deeply and infrequently. Meaning, you know, I always sometimes people ask, you know, is there some sort of moisture meter I can buy or some way I can monitor my soil? The best thing you got is your finger. You actually need to be digging down in your soil and seeing how deeply am I wetting as I water. 
and you know think about how deeply do I want those roots to grow. Now we can overdo it. We can you know flood plants and put too much water down. But you know if we have moisture down six to eight inches when we water, that's a good thing. That's going to encourage those roots to grow. If we're watering every day and we're just wetting the top inch of the soil, guess where our roots are going to be? Top inch of the soil. And that means they're not going to find all the nutrition they need because they're going to deplete that limited area. So we like to water deeply and infrequently. So rather than watering every single day, water, you know, two or three times a week deeply, and you're still supplying adequate water and you're encouraging those roots to go deeper. Certainly, you know, there's any, you know, if you look online, you will see people talk about adding in acids to planting holes, adding uh, calcium to, you know, um, eggshells or something like that to planting holes whenever you're planting tomatoes. Just understand that any material we put into the soil has to turn into an ion that's dissolved in that water, and that takes time and effort. So you can put calcium carbonate tablets in the soil. It's probably not going to dramatically increase the available calcium to that plant. If you water correctly, that's how we get more water delivered to that developing tomato, and we allow it to have sufficient calcium. Um, there are some sprays that are kind of like rescue treatments that contain calcium that you can spray plants with, but I always tell people that, you know, trying to get the foliage to absorb large amounts of nutrients is never a good plan. That's not what it was designed to do. So if you're seeing a good effects from foliar feedings, whether calcium or something else, your plant's probably in a really bad situation or highly deficient because that's not the way plants want to take in nutrients. They want to take them in from the soil through their roots. So I'm not saying you can't use those when you're seeing a problem, but unless you address the water availability issue, you're always going to be having to do that because it's how that plant gets the calcium. It's through water, through the roots. And so everything else is just a stopgap measure that may for a moment help resolve something. But the reality is our soils in this region are not deficient in calcium at all. And so we shouldn't have to worry about adding calcium. Never, ever, ever use lime as a calcium source because then you'll push your pH too high. So sometimes people think, oh, I'll use lime. Don't do that. That's, that, that can make a whole host of other problems happen because now other nutrients become less available at higher pHs. So never use lime to solve a calcium deficiency. This truly isn't a calcium deficiency in the soil in the first place. If you want to add something to add calcium, add gypsum. Gypsum is not going to change the pH. It will add calcium, but I promise you, your soil is not deficient in calcium. Spend it on a good fertility product or a good irrigation system, and you'll see better effects for your garden than adding calcium. One thing I always like to mention to folks too, and a lot of uh, folks that are growing in the garden do think about this, but sometimes not, especially beginning gardeners, how should we hold our tomatoes and peppers? Because lots of times when things are going gangbusters, we're getting more than we can use in a short term. So how do we store them for longevity or to keep them happy? Well, we can actually get chilling injury on tomato and pepper fruits, which means they're not gonna last as long and the quality is not gonna be there if they don't stay above 45 degrees. So it begs the question, how cold is our refrigerator? They're supposed to be, and if they're not, this is a problem. They're supposed to be 40 degrees or lower, and that's about limiting microbial growth. That's why we use low temperature. It doesn't kill microbes that might hurt us with food, but it lowers their basically speed of growth. And so, you know, if your fridge is not below 40 degrees or at least 40, you've got a problem there from a food safety concern. But basically what that tells us is we shouldn't be putting tomato and pepper fruit into the refrigerator. And so even uh, I've worked with a commercial distributor of produce before. Uh, and when we would have our product in a uh, tractor trailer that had other stuff that had to be cool, you would actually put blankets on the pallets of peppers and tomatoes. Now, it's not like blankets like you use at your home, but it, it functionally is the exact same thing. It was to insulate that product and prevent the cold air from reaching it. Because if you let it get cold, let's say you're, you're hauling broccoli or something like that and that needs 32 degrees, if you're hauling it in the same trailer, you have to protect those peppers and tomato fruit or you're gonna have a problem when it gets delivered. So don't put these in the fridge to maintain their quality. 
Room temperature is better than putting them in the fridge. They'll actually last longer and you'll have better results. So I mentioned this website earlier, uthort.com. Uh, it's got a lot of publications. When uh, This is the tab you see if you click on educational resources. You can see they have it categorized. It's not just vegetable stuff. It's all the horticultural world. They've got a... Um, search box up at the top that I encourage you to use. I think it's faster and easier if you're looking for something tomato, just to type in tomato and search for it, rather than go through the vegetable garden tab because it's gonna have every vegetable garden publication that we have at UT, but they're listed as they were created. And so if, it, if it's new, you'll find it quickly. If it's older, it's gonna be down the list. So sometimes it's easier to actually search than it is just to go through the category, but you can go through the category and see all that's there. And there's a lot of publications, not just tomatoes and peppers. So if there's something you're wanting to learn more about, if you uh, use that search bar, you'll probably find something useful. This is actually some of the publications that I've put together, include some resources from other universities uh, that I find interesting and good, some things related to scouting for diseases and in insects. Uh, University of Kentucky in particular has some IPM manuals that I think have great pictures that kind of help clue you in maybe something's going wrong. It's not that we can always diagnose things from pictures. Oftentimes we cannot, but it can at least let us know, hey, something is going awry. Something's off about this plant. So I do like those. They're listed there well, as well as some other resources. So certainly um, take advantage of that. You see the website there, the QR code, if you're not on a smart device at the moment, um, that you can actually do that perhaps, but uh, certainly the link will also be included, the resources in the email I send out. So with that, I will pause for questions.